Hey art nerds! Today I'm going to show you how to paint a watercolor comic page. This is the second of two watercolor comic tutorials. I'll link the first one right here. And I have a few other watercolor comic tutorials here on this channel that you guys can check out. I'll make sure to link those throughout this video. This is also part of an ongoing series, so I'll link that playlist as well. So the first step, once you've stretched your watercolor paper, and again I have tutorials on how to do that as well. The first step is toning your watercolor panels. Now toning kind of sets the scene, it sets the environment, it creates an atmosphere, and it establishes light sources and shadows. So for me, toning is a really important part of figuring out how my final page is going to eventually look. So here in the top three panels, I applied a wash of uh, neutral tint mixed with purple and that's to show that Naomi's room is still dark and I lifted a little bit of that out with some paper towel. Now I'm applying a wash of yellow into the windows as to show the early morning sunlight streaming in. Now in that bottom panel I went ahead and I toned the whole thing um, sort of a warm pink to give it a warm rosy feeling. And now I'm applying a very very light wash of blue to these middle panels. These take place in a bathroom. Now the bottom panel doesn't have any particular environment or background in it. So I'm filling it in with a warm hot pink and that kind of reestablishes the warm and rosy feeling. Now I'm applying another wash of ultramarine blue to those interior panels. I'm trying to better establish the lighting. It is a bathroom with kind of clinical lighting in early morning. So when you're watercoloring comic pages, it's not necessarily all that different from watercoloring individual illustrations. There's definitely some considerations to keep in mind, and I'll make sure I link uh, blog posts and tutorials that kind of dive into that a little bit further. This has been drastically condensed for time. The whole page took about eight hours of total painting time, and that does not include drying time, just me recording myself painting. Um, which means I painted it over the course of three days. So it's a bit time consuming to paint a watercolor comic page, but I also have to admit that recording myself painting a comic page made the process take longer. So if you're not recording yourself, it's a faster process. And a lot of what you've learned from painting standalone illustrations, particularly if you have an inked style or if you work in a cartoony style, a lot of that is going to be applicable. To painting your watercolor comic pages. So one of the first things I do is rather than painting each panel one at a time like it's a tiny standalone illustration, I handle everything in batches. And often when I'm painting watercolor comic pages, I'm painting three or four pages at a time. So if I'm painting one object, let's say the light blue on her bed, that would be a white but it's in shadow, or the, bl the light blues in the bathroom, I do all of that in batch. So basically everything that is shaded shadow white right now, I'm filling in or I'm adding an ultramarine blue um, shadow to that to kind of imply that it is white that is in shadow. Now you don't have to use ultra ultramarine blue for your white shadows. That's my preference in many instances. Um, and so for those top panels, I also decided that my shadow color wasn't strong enough, that I need to go back in and reestablish those shadows to really reinforce that she's waking up in a dark room. So I'm going ahead and I'm adding another toning layer of the shadow color that I mixed up to better help establish my shadows. And you can see I'm doing all three of those panels at the same time. I'm not necessarily waiting for one panel to dry. I will pretty much only wait for things to dry if it affects, if it impedes me from painting other panels adjacent to it. And if that's the case, I often will move on to a completely non-adjacent panel and work on that. So one of the nice things about working on watercolor comics is since you have multiple panels and if you're working on multiple pages, you can almost work non-stop. Dry times are not going to significantly prevent you from being able to make progress. So now I'm using a Payne's Gray to fill in the mirrors 
And I apologize if you guys can hear that siren noise in the background. One of my neighbor's car alarm has been going off for the past 15 minutes and I went back into my bedroom to record the audio trying to avoid it and I cannot. So I do apologize. It is intensely distracting. A while back, a neighbor's car alarm went off for three days straight here. I think they went on vacation and left their annoying car. So now I'm applying a very light wash of ultramarine blue to the mirrors. I'm just trying to build up the idea that she's looking at herself in the reflection. And I will spoil this a little bit and say that I feel like in the finished page, I wasn't as successful as I've been in the past. So this chapter is a little bit different from some of my other chapters. This is a bonus chapter of Seven Inch Kara where we follow things from Naomi's perspective and it kind of follows her first day of school and her experiences in a new town that happens to be an intensely small and cliquish town, kind of like what I grew up in. Um, and down there in the bottom panel, I filled in the phone's glass with water and now I'm doing a wet into wet technique using pink and yellow to kind of give that look of like those flower crown filters. So something soft, hazy, and a little bit digital. Oh, you can see my face there. Um, I would love to be able to see what I'm... So one of the reasons I don't like recording myself working on comic pages is this is completely different from how I normally work. I normally work sitting on the floor with four pages spread out around me. I don't sit at a desk when I'm painting and I just pick up the pages and hold them in my lap as I paint. So working at a desk flat recording is very, very different from how I normally work. Um, this is a your mileage may vary sort of situation. I recommend you work how you're comfortable. So for the marble on her countertops, I did a wash of very light ultramarine blue, and then I dabbed in some Payne's gray. And you can see this doesn't differ significantly from my normal comic process, right? We're doing a lot of layers. Everything is handled fairly controlled. Um, for doing comic pages the way I do comic pages, I do need to keep things relatively tight so that it's readable and understandable. You might want to utilize some fine art watercolor techniques or get looser if it serves your story or if it serves the style of your story or if it has an emotional component that it adds to the story. But um, in general, storytelling and legibility are kind of the most important things when it comes to comics since it is a form of literature. So um, I'm not doing any really fun or wild techniques on these. I just am working very straightforward in layers. And this is a simplified uh, variety of my watercolor style. Since I have inks on this, I'm only doing about three layers of color rather than the really heavily rendered pages that I normally do for 7-inch Kara. If you guys are interested in learning how I paint my other kinds of comic pages, I have a couple of tutorials, as I mentioned earlier. So Naomi has... Um, darker skin. She's a black character and I find that it's really helpful when I'm rendering darker skin tones if I apply my blush colors and my shadow colors first and then apply my skin tone on top of that. That allows me to kind of establish the blush without um, sort of lifting it up if I were to apply a light glaze on top of darker skin tones. And you guys will see what I mean. This is a similar technique that I use for alcohol marker art. So um, I have a tutorial on that. The same kind of thought process applies. Basically, we're still applying our lightest colors first. They just happen to be the shadow and the blush. And I've talked in other tutorials about painting fat over lean, even in watercolor. What this means is that our lightest washes are washes with the least amount of color saturation. I apply those first, and then I continue to build up saturation and pigment load as I paint. Um, with glazing, glazing means you're painting a light wash or a medium wash of color on top of perhaps a thicker wash of color. Now, this can often lead to muddiness if you're painting like a really light wash of like a peach or a pink or a red on top of like a darker skin tone that you've already built up several layers. So that's why I apply the blush and the shadow first. And I'm applying that same hot pink in onto her towels just to kind of give the impression that those are her towels. Um, she's an only child uh, to a single parent currently. So it, she kind of <laughs> rules the roost. She's a good kid though. Um, 
I don't mean to imply that she's like a bratty kid or anything. She's just an only child. Perhaps that's why she and Kara bond so instantly. They're both only children. Which is funny because I have a younger brother and I don't actually have any desire to be an only child. My brother and I get along pretty well now. Perhaps uh, I wrote them as only children just because having siblings in this kind of a story would cause a lot of, a lot of conflict that could be very interesting in another tiny person story. So I'm using a light wash of burnt sienna to color in the cabinets in her bathroom. Looks like her dad actually had a chance to renovate the bathroom. He did not have a chance to renovate the kitchen as those of you who support me through the uh, or for the 7 inch Kara volume 2 Kickstarter will see. Their kitchen is very dated and their house is based on the house that my mom grew up in in Hawnville, Louisiana. So you guys can see I often use the blue painter's tape as a bit of a side palette, especially if I'm only applying a color in one or two places. Um, I also use it to remove excess color from my brush so that I can handle the brush a little bit more easily. This does have some downfalls as you know, you can pick it up with your hand and smear it on your watercolor paper, or you just get it on your hand in general. I, I do get it on my hand a couple of times in this tutorial. It's pretty easy just to wipe it off. Um, but I think the, con the convenience for me personally outweighs the annoyance. So I continue to utilize that. And these comic pages, it, they often sort of sit at the ugly or unfinished stage for a long period of time. And then they come together really quickly, as you guys will probably see. So I'm spending a lot of time just kind of coloring in individual elements. Now I'm finally adding the shadow color to her skin tone. And that was a mix of purple, naphthamide, maroon, and um, a little bit of permanent mauve. Yep, those colors. <laughs> so for darker skin tones, I like to mix my shadow colors a little bit more darker and a little bit more purple influenced. For lighter skin tones, I tend more towards uh, permanent mauve, uh, red violet, and naphthamide maroon without as much of the dioxine purple mixed in. And of course, how you handle your colors, what mixes you use, those are going to be totally up to you. Now, I've talked about using convenience colors, and I've shown you guys my Daily Driver palette a few times, so I'm going to link those rather than going into too much detail. I do have a large palette of about 50 colors. I have a lot of pre-mixed convenience colors in that palette, purples, mauves. Uh, Payne's grays, colors like that. But I also do a lot of my own color mixing, particularly when it comes to skin tones. I find that um, tube-based skin tones like uh, Jean Brilliant, those tend to be very opaque. So um, I like to do my own skin tone mixing. And even for darker skin tones, I never just use like one particular color. I like to do a custom mix for the characters. So in general, I like to fill my large areas first and then work towards filling in my smaller areas. Larger areas are usually painted with wetter washes, with looser washes first, as you can see with these walls. Um, and I find that going like large, very wet wash areas to small, very dry sort of fill areas helps me prevent bleeding and leaching. Now, sometimes I want that. I want like a little bit of like maybe atmospheric or reflective color. So I want it to kind of bleed out into the surrounding atmosphere. But generally I work large objects to small objects and I work light to dark. <laughs> 
So Naomi's eyes are hazel. They shift from blue to green. And for that, it's actually pretty simple. I use Winsor & Newton's olive green as the base, and then I mix in a little bit of Sennelier ultramarine blue. And that gives me a really nice color shift and color depth. And generally when that dries, I'll add in a little bit more ultramarine blue to establish the shadows at the tops of the eyes. And I usually let a wet into wet mix handle the blending on our eyes. Now I apologize for blocking your view just there. Um, working on a piece like this at my desk does have unique challenges. So now I'm about to begin working on her skin tone. So I showed you guys my swatch book and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find the right mix for her skin, the mix that I normally use. I don't have it necessarily, I have the colors kind of memorized, but I don't necessarily have the proportions memorized and different situations are going to call for different mixes, different lighting situations are gonna call for different mixes. So having a swatch book handy is really good for testing out colors before you commit to the page. And you can see that the toning and the blush show through this first layer of skin tone. Now, they're going to get a little bit lost and I'm going to have to reestablish them with much thicker mixes. But I find that this method really works best when I'm painting darker skin tones. For Naomi, I also color in her hair when I'm first doing the first layer on her skin, and that's just to provide kind of a base color, and I'm going to leave that as the highlight to her hair and work her hair darker. So even for a simplified style like this, I still do a few layers to the skin to build up the color depth, to build up the form, and to kind of develop shadow. So for this art style, I use about three layers of the initial skin tone color mix. I might mix them a little bit darker or allow them to evaporate a little bit over time so that they can become a little bit more intense, but it's about three layers. Now for my other Kara pages that are a bit more rendered, that really can vary based on the needs of the page. <laughs> 
So my watercolor painting process, my watercolor comic painting process has been developed over about 10 years. I first started painting 7-inch Kara in 2012. Uh, that's not fair. We're a little bit short of 10 years. Um, and my style and how I handle the watercolor, the materials I use, those have all evolved over time. This past year, I've spent a lot of time reviewing different watercolors because I wanted to find alternatives to Windsor & Newton that would perform better or would have different handling properties but were also more affordable because I felt like I was paying a lot of money and not necessarily getting what I really wanted out of my paints. So I generally paint with professional grade paints. My palette is a hodgepodge mix of several different brands. We have a lot of Windsor Newton, we have Daniel Smith, we have Magello, we have a lot of Holbein, we have some Sennelier. And I also have sub palettes. I'll show you those in a moment. And those sub palettes might have very specific types of color or very specific color properties. And I keep those out of my main palette because I don't necessarily want those colors um, taking up space or kind of confusing me. Like I have a lot of Holbein's very opaque colors and I love using them for Naomi's clothes and they're very helpful for this chapter. In fact, she has a whole palette for herself now, um, but they're not colors that I would use all the time because they're very opaque, which means they're very prone to muddiness, which means they have to be kind of handled in a special way. Now, when I'm painting comic pages, I use a mixture of brushes. I really prefer Kalinsky Sable brushes myself. My cat also prefers them and he likes to eat them. So um, I can't afford to have all super nice brushes because Bowie will wreck them. So I have a mix of some Kalinsky Sable brushes, some squirrel hair brushes, which are good for filling large areas but can be harder to control because they're a bit like a wet noodle. A fair number of synthetic brushes, especially as we talk about larger brush sizes. And I actually have a couple of videos where I talk about my favorite brushes for watercolor, as well as a video I think is pretty good where I talk about whether hobbyist student or pro watercolors are for you. So I'll make sure I link those here and in the description so you guys can check those out and make the best decisions for you personally. Because when it comes to watercolor, so much of this is going to be subjective. There's so many paints that I don't like that other people swear by. And I value the difference in opinion because we all handle our watercolors differently and we all have different expectations. So, um, I am also painting on Canson Montval watercolor paper. This is a cellulose-based watercolor paper that I think really lends itself to the type of comic work I do. I feel like it has qualities of both a decent cotton rag paper as well as some of the better properties of cellulose papers. So this paper, I find I don't get muddiness unless like the weather's really, really humid or the, I'm painting with a different water. So like when I'm in Louisiana, I'll buy a bottle of distilled water. If you're painting with hard water, water that has a lot of minerals, you might want to use distilled water because that can actually definitely affect how your paints handle and how they look when they've dried. If you notice that your colors look kind of dull or kind of muddy and you're painting with pro quality watercolors, it could be the water that you're using. So when I switch states, I buy a bottle of distilled water and that helps me kind of control things. Um, so it also dries really quickly because it is a cellulose paper. So that means instead of like really soaking into the paper, the pigments and the water kind of sit on top. So you do need to be careful with how you handle cellulose papers, but they're also a bit more affordable than cotton rag paper. So generally I will use cotton rag paper if I'm painting a standalone illustration that takes up most of the page. If I'm painting a comic page like this with individual panels, I will, use cellulose paper, I'll use Canson Montval paper because um, I can run it through my printer. I can also run cotton rag papers through my printer, but the blue lines are more distinct on this paper. It allows me to pencil or ink it more easily. They still wash off really easily. So it's like, I never, I never had blue lines at all. And um, it, stress, it stretches decently well. And I don't have some of the kipping and pooling problems that I would have on other cellulose-based watercolor papers. And I've tested a lot of watercolor papers here and on, on the blog as well, because I'm always interested. If there's a product that fits what I'm doing better than what I'm using, I'm always interested in finding out about it and giving it a try. But Canson Montval still holds a really special place to my heart in my heart. And I haven't found a cellulose paper for my watercolor comics that I prefer to it.
There are cellulose watercolor papers that I like for other things, like spot color ink illustrations. I actually really like Fabriano Studio for that, but I hate Fabriano Studio for watercolor. So it's all about experimenting and finding things that work for you. So I'm happy to share with you guys what I like and what I use and why I like it. And I'll have a link in the description below all about watercolor papers because I've written about this over on the blog quite extensively. Um, but in the end, it's, it's for you to take what I've said and think about what you want to make and then make your own best judgments. So you guys can see that I'm building up these these panels layer by layer and they all kind of come together at the same pace because I'm kind of color coloring book filling things in if that makes sense panel by panel so all the skin tone gets filled in all of the blanket gets filled in all the towel gets filled in etc and I really cannot imagine trying to paint them panel by panel that sounds like a terrible nightmare so um it just seems like it would take so much longer and they would be so much more prone to like a little bit of water getting on it and ruining it. And I don't necessarily feel like I need to walk you through my watercolor process step by step since I have so many other tutorials on this channel where I do just that. I think you guys can probably get a good idea looking at what I'm doing and then um, making your own best guesses. But you guys can see I work with light loose washes and build them up over time. That's really the biggest thing that I do when it comes to watercolor comic pages. And um, if you're interested in checking out more of my work, you can read the first five chapters of 7-Inch Care for free at 7inchcare.com and 7inchcare.tumblr.com. I've been sharing it as a webcomic. I'm currently up to chapter eight. Well, this bonus chapter, so this is like chapter nine or 8.5, I guess. It's a 15 page long bonus chapter. Um, I'm currently finished with up to chapter eight, but I don't plan on running chapter six through eight until after I've kickstarted the second volume. So if you like what I do and you want to help support what I'm doing and you enjoy my comic work, I would love it if you guys would help support me on Patreon. And I'll let you guys know when that's going to be up. In fact, honestly, I may hold this video until I'm launching the Kickstarter. So I don't know, you'll have to check the description. But it really would mean the world to me if you guys would support me with that because this is 7 Inch Kara is um, my passion project and it's a project that I've spent a lot of time on. And I use Kara and Naomi as the test subjects in my field tests all the time. So um, it's a very dear project to my heart and it's the one that I really want to see succeed. And oh my gosh, that horrible alarm finally <laughs> stopped going off. Oh my gosh, it was really messing with my ADHD and making it super hard to think of what I wanted to say to you guys. So I'm so relieved it's done. <laughs>
So I've held off on painting her hair until I have her skin pretty established. And part of the reason I do this is it lets me gauge how dark I'm going to go with her hair. She has a really dark brown black hair color and I use these really soft sort of sprouncy curly cue brush strokes particularly in her little afro puff she's pulled her hair up for school um and you guys can kind of see it better here and I develop her hair much the same way I develop her skin where we start with um we utilize the base skin tone as like the base color the highlight and that kind of ties her hair and her skin together for me and um, I mix in more black and more sepia in order to achieve a really nice, rich, dark brown for, or brown black for her hair. And then once I have like the base layers, the wetter layers of her hair established, I'm going to move on to painting her silk nightcap. And this is um, M. Graham's manganese blue, which is a really pretty blue color that I know Naomi would wear. She likes sort of bright, saturated colors. She's a teenager, so she's attracted to really nice, pretty, bright colors. And I use this as a contrast to Kara, who often wears very um, muted or desaturated colors that might be made from natural dyes. And it's just to kind of separate their two worlds visually. We have more muted, soft, more pastel or um, earthy tones for Kara, and then very saturated kind of synthetic dye colors for Naomi. So something else I do when I'm painting watercolor comics is I work from the same Daisy Well palette the entire time. Sometimes I might clean out wells. Sometimes I might grab another Daisy Well, but I don't clean it from day to day. And part of the reason I do this is I can reactivate color mixes I've already mixed and use them to add shadows to like the skin tone or shadows to like the walls. So um, originally you guys saw me working with a cleaned out uh, ice cream mochi container. I use that for my larger mixes because they can hold a lot of paint. And then I switch over to a little inexpensive mm -hmm. daisy palette like that one that you guys just saw when I'm doing smaller areas. And both of those are really inexpensive. Um, I've tried a lot of different palettes. In fact, I donated a bunch of palettes because I just like those palettes and the other palettes that I've tried do not work for me as well. So it's really all about finding what works for you and finding out what you like and what works with your watercolor style. But I really like the little inexpensive Daisy Well palettes. They're very easy to clean with like a magic eraser. They're very inexpensive. You can find them at lots of different art supply stores. You can find them at Walmart sometimes. You can find them at Michael's. So they're a very accessible way to paint watercolor comics. Plus you get like 10 wells in them. So you can do a lot of color mixing. And you can see off to the bottom right hand, um, there's like a new palette, a new half pan palette on the table. That's Naomi's specific color palette for like her clothing and stuff. So it contains a lot of almost neon colors, opera roses, really um, bright Quinn colors, really bright blues, because that's the sort of stuff Naomi wears. Speaking of, she's wearing a very hot pink sleep shirt. I don't know how anybody could sleep in something that bright, but I guess Naomi can. <laughs> 
So at this point, all major forms have been filled in with color or have a, I've established what kind of colors are going to be in those forms. So at this point, I'm kind of just adding details and tightening things up. And I save that for the end of the illustration. I try not to get too detailed in the earlier stages because that can really lead to muddiness. And when I'm teaching watercolor, I see a lot of beginner watercolorists get really excited about like, painting the eyes and adding a lot of detail to the eyes or painting the lashes and the brows and adding a lot of detail to that. And then they try to paint the skin on top of it and it reactivates all those pigments and it turns into a mess. So I, even though it seems really tempting to dive into that because when we start adding details to the face, that's when the characters seem to come to life. It's best if we wait until kind of the end. Sometimes if I get really excited about it, I'll make notes on like a little post-it pad that I can refer to later on when I'm further along with the piece. So at this point, I'm just kind of going back and I added an additional layer of blush to her cheeks, um, maybe an additional layer of shadow beneath like her jawline. And now I'm adding some of the shadow color to her hair turban. I'm also adding the quote unquote text um, on her phone and blending it out a little bit with water. And I'm painting the user icons and I'm keeping those really simple. It's just little wet into wet washes. Um, they're not really meant to steal the show, but it is meant to give the implication that she's posting. It's, it's pictogram in this comic, but um, it's Instagram. So at this point, I'm also working with a really fine brush to add further details. That's something I should have mentioned to you guys earlier on. Oh, and on the, I'm trying to make the, the mirror look more like a mirror. So I'm adding more Payne's gray and then lifting it up with um, a clean piece of paper towel just to kind of um, put in that color and then remove a dish too much color. Anyway, um, I really recommend you guys start with the largest brush you can comfortably handle. And if you're new to watercolor, it is a bigger brush than you think, especially for filling in large areas. I recommend you don't use something like a four or a two. And I see people do that. And it's like trying to, trying to carve Mount Rushmore with like, a spoon like <laughs> maybe you could do it but it's gonna take forever and you're not gonna like the end result start with your largest brush that you're comfortable handling so I wanted a kind of a speckly like a magical kind of background for her phone so I sprinkled mm -hmm. some salt in hoping that it would do like this the snowflake effect that we usually can get didn't happen so at this point, everything's had a chance to dry. I'm just going in with some watercolor pencils to add some, some shadow, to add some white highlight, or to further refine some color. I really save my watercolor pencils for just like the smallest of details, um, partially because as you guys probably know, I am not really a color pencil person. They take too long to use, so I wouldn't want to be filling large areas with these, but it can be great if you have a really limited watercolor collection or even a really limited alcohol marker collection using watercolor pencils and color pencils to kind of extend the colors you have can be really useful. So my favorites are Derwent Ink Tents. So these are India ink based watercolor pencils. They are water soluble, but once you, once you activate them with water, they're never going to budge. So they could be really good for doing layers. I also really like Karen Dosh's Super Color 2 and their Museum Aquarell, but the Museum Aquarell is quite expensive. And I also like Faber-Castell's Albrecht Durer watercolor pencils. Now those are also India ink based and they are a little bit more opaque. So depending on how you work with color, they could they could add a lot of brightness to your piece but if you like transparency they could muddy what you're doing now they work really well on black paper so if you're doing watercolor on black paper those would be the watercolor pencils that i would recommend <laughs> 
And then finally, I'm adding white, very white highlights using white gouache. Um, this is just Utrecht brand white gouache. I'm not super picky about my white gouaches. Store brands are fine. Um, and white gouache is just an opaque watercolor that's mixed much more thickly than regular watercolor. And I really like it for adding back in white highlights, like the highlights on hair or in the eyes or on cat whiskers. Now, um, you can tell I'm not a fine art watercolor artist because I have no problem going back in with the white gouache to add it. I am commercial all the way. Um, and I mean, that's okay because comics aren't fine art anyway, right guys? Um, anyway, I use the white gouache to add some highlights to the mirror as well to try and increase like how it it reading as a mirror without covering up like it, Naomi's face or important gestures and I also added some white highlights to the phone to give it like that reflective glass sort of look and you can also blend your white gouache out using a little bit of water now I talked about how earlier um, if you apply something um, very saturated, very opaque, and then you apply water on top of it, you can get some color reactivation. I actually wanted that with the white gouache on the mirror, so that was a desired effect. Anyway, this piece is done. Allow it to dry for at least a couple hours, allow it to dry fully, and now we're going to remove our blue painter's tape. Now, when I remove my blue painter's tape, I pull it away at a 90 degree angle to the paper, and that way, if there's any tearing, if the tape has really adhered to the paper and it wants to rip, it's gonna rip outside the comic page rather than ripping into the comic page. And it looks like this time we actually have a really clean removal. You also want to wait until any of the paint that you may have applied to your blue tape has dried because it could get back onto the page again. And there we have it, a finished seven inch Kara page. This was a lot of work. Like I told you guys, it took me about eight hours of like active painting time to paint this. And I painted it over three days. So just imagine how much time it takes to paint a multi-hundred page comic. Think about that before you start your watercolor comic. Anyway, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I hope I will see you guys again in the near future. For more links, please check the description down below. And have a wonderful day, guys. Bye!